Hi everyone, welcome back to the channel and today I'm excited to have here with me Dr. Vinay Suresh who is currently an intern at King George Medical University. Dr. Vinay Suresh is an aspiring physician scientist who has over 50 plus publications, 115 citations and an H index of 6. His works involve mostly the field of neurology with specific interest on vascular neurology, tropical neurology and movement disorders just to name a few. He's also the full-time member, uh, nominated full-time member of the prestigious Research Scientific Honor Society Sigma 11, which has over 200 Nobel laureates and some of the world's geniuses like Albert Einstein and Richard Feynman as their full-time member. Dr. Vinay Suresh is also the founder of Research Peer Network, a network which aims to help medical students with research activities and they do a lot of projects under the banner of Research Peer Network which connects medical students with researchers across the globe. He is also one of the youngest members to be granted a junior travel fellowship by the World Federation of Neurology. So with that brief introduction, I would like to welcome Dr. Vinay Suresh on this channel. It's a pleasure to have you. Thank you, Omar. Thank you. Yeah, so let me just uh, jump into how I got uh, to know about you. So one day I was uh, going through my LinkedIn profile and uh, I came across a post which you uh, had posted on your LinkedIn and that just blew my mind. So what I saw was that your latest meta-analysis which you had published in the uh, P Journal of uh, Pediatric Neurology, it was a meta-analysis and it was uh, first of its kind that was published in Times of India and at various newspapers where you found an association between biomarkers and cerebral palsy. So when I saw that post which you um, put on LinkedIn, that's when I got to know about you. And as I went through your profile, I had to say that I was way beyond impressed. It is probably one of the best LinkedIn profiles as a medical student that I saw. And in fact, when I saw that, I was hit with a question like, oh, these people really exist in our country. So that was my honest reaction. So with that, I just wanted to know, uh, I'm just curious and my, probably my followers, the viewers of this video are curious as well. Like what got you started into medical research? Is this something that you have always wanted to know even before joining a medical college or is it something that you have uh, got from the culture at King George Medical University? Could you just explain how you got into the field of medical research and specifically neurology as well? Sure, Dr. Omar. Uh, thanks for inviting me, and uh, it's lovely to have uh, to have this opportunity to talk about research and my experiences. So, uh, the answer to that question is actually a mix of everything. Uh, but to start off with, I would say that I did not know that I would uh, that I would get into research or I would like research before I joined medical college. Mm -hmm. I was uh, actually very curious person, but scientifically, I was very curious. I I read a lot on things. And so, but once I uh, entered first year in KBMU, that is when uh, my research journey started, when I was fortunate to meet some of my mentors, uh, some of my seniors. And uh, my first uh, projects were actually international multicentric uh, studies, which uh, I still remember. I was just uh, recruited as one of those people who would collect data and upload it using, uh, I mean, I, I used to upload it on RedCap which is like this web interface where I had to upload patient data. I was called at around uh, 9, 10 o'clock in the night in, uh, into the wards and, and even in the ICU, sitting there in the corner and entering data in a red cap interface. And these were basically international studies which are initiated by departments in uh, abroad, like in the US. And uh, there were teams within our departments which were working on that. So. Uh, we were supposed to upload patient data. That, that's when I realized, okay, research, uh, I mean, I started learning about research. That was my first exposure to research. And uh, that was uh, there was no stopping after that because uh, it interested me so much that um, uh, I pursued it. And uh, today, uh, the reason why I'm, I have all those accomplishments is because um, I was quite consistent and this curiosity sort of drove me from the past three years. So, yeah. That's the reason how that's how I actually got into research. Okay, so uh, is it right to say that the culture at King George Medical University did play a big role? 
So was there any specific reason why you joined KGMU? Were you aware of this before or did you come to know about this research culture uh, once you joined uh, the college? So yes, I would say that the culture is here is very good, but then uh, it, I need to specify more on that. Uh, if you are interested and if you want to pursue research, then the culture is good. There are departments which are really helpful. Uh, I started off with the neurosurgery department and I collaborated with professors in surgery. Then eventually uh, I, got, I collaborated with uh, professors in neurology who, where I ended up uh, collaborating most of my work with. And my mentors are from you know, neurology now. And I'm fortunate enough to actually meet some of the best professors in the country who specialize in their field and who are trained and seasoned researchers. So I would say that, uh, I mean, in, uh, it's it's always the case, right, where you have to be interested and the environment needs to be uh, right. So if you are interested and if you're an individual who would pursue research, then yes, the culture is pretty good. Uh, uh, you can see that in statistics, right, out of, uh, I mean, 250 students, you hardly have few people who are pursuing research. So the, the culture is definitely good, but you need to be uh, interested. And uh, about your question, whether I knew about this before, not at all. I, I joined King George. Um, honestly, the reason why I joined the college was because at the time I got a good rank and yeah, I didn't have, uh, I mean, I was not satisfied with uh, the colleges within my state at the time. Uh, and at the time I was a bit naive on these things and just because, and also the fact that I was in my home for the last 18 years, I really wanted to go outside and explore. So that's why I chose, chose King George Medical University. Oh, I'm just glad to know that uh, that's one area where we could relate. <laughs> now, coming to the next part, like uh, you might be aware that most of my followers and viewers are medical students. So I cater to that audience. And one of the questions medical students and including me uh, on this part we have is uh, for most of us, uh, as you might be aware, the culture in the medical colleges in India is not that research heavy apart from some special institutions, most of them are at the clinical side of things and less on the research side of things. So for the medical students who wants to get into research, what would be the first or the best initial step to take? What would be one advice that you would like to give for the beginners out there? Yeah, so that's a very important question. And in my opinion, uh, I've been asked this a lot and I think it's a major barrier. and. Uh, yeah, most of uh, the government medical colleges in India. And uh, it's an issue because uh, uh, the research culture is not established as such. And uh, like I said, it's a general issue across the country. And how to circumvent this? So I, uh, in my opinion, I think that uh, a person can actually, a medical student can do research uh, if they are interested enough. And how can they do that? So first start off with understanding the basics of research, understanding the various research designs, and if you are really interested, I would recommend you to actually go ahead and learn statistics because it, it differentiates you from other researchers. And that's the advantage that I enjoy. And I would also, uh, I mean, I would recommend you to actually reach out to professors in those departments in which you are interested in the subject. Because um, what happens is every department would have residents and they will be conducting thesis. Yeah. Although thesis is uh, like it's not taken seriously in some places, but in some other places they are, and it doesn't hurt to actually go and approach a professor that you're interested in research, and you should do some background work. You shouldn't approach a person who is definitely not into these things. You should ask residents there. You should probably ask other people you know, your seniors, and then you approach the right professors and let them know that you're interested in research. Many times, what happens, even in my case, is they involve you in their. Uh, in their ongoing studies. So in my case, when I approached uh, the in Department of Neurology, uh, who is now my mentor, uh, Dr. Malhotra, so he actually involved me in a case control study in uh, subacute sclerosing panencephalitis. And uh, that is when I actually got first-hand exposure in clinical research. I interpreted the data. I presented it in the uh, AAN autoimmune neurology conference. And uh, yeah, so uh, that's that was one of the... Uh, like uplifting steps in my research career. So I would recommend the same to everyone. Reach out to the departments uh, you're interested in, the professors, and uh, communicate to them. Nobody is going to scold you, right? Uh, at most, they're just going to reject you. They're just going to say, I'm busy, come back later. But it's nobody is going to scold you. So there's nothing to lose. 
uh, take up the initiative uh, until unless you take up initiative nothing's going to happen in the field of research so i think that would be a good step to start off with one other uh, good thing is um, nowadays you have many organizations uh, across which are like inter college uh, uh, setups you have uh, student organizations you have committees uh, i won't name any i, I mean of course i am uh, the founder of one of them and uh, we basically are a group of people who are interested in research and are from colleges across india so it's better to get involved in research uh, in research study designs which are um, which are actually easy to conduct in in the form of a team uh, virtually so uh, i mean some of you might be aware there are basically two different kinds of research original original research and you have reviews so reviews like uh, systematic reviews scoping reviews rapid reviews you have systematic review uh, meta analysis so all of these come under reviews and these are uh, in the evidence pyramid they have a higher uh, weightage so it's better to get involved in teams of people who you can trust and you can make a team even from your own college right and uh, work virtually because in that way you'll also learn a lot about research and you won't be wasting a lot of time uh so uh, you know finding the right people and most of these projects actually they lead on let they become obsolete they die out so it's it's important that you reach out to the right people and you get involved in the right team so that's one other thing a medical student can do actually uh, sign up in, uh, for these organizations which are actually trustable and uh, work on these reviews work in good teams so you'll get exposure to research that's one other way you can actually do research thanks a lot for the advice so what i can summarize is that the best way to, is to start with the mentor then upskill along the way join the organizations research organizations so having said that i would like to now know more about the organization of which you are a founder the research peer network i'm also a member of that organization i'm fortunate to be a member of that organization i must say that uh, and so i just wanted to know i'm just curious like what made you start such an organization was it the lack of research culture across the medical students in the country or did you feel like uh, there is a need for more medical students entering into research i'm just curious to know um, the founding of research via network okay so uh, that's a nice question because uh, it's actually the latter uh, i felt that there is a need to create a, a network because uh, so it started off when i was in my third year and uh, we had founded a ug research uh, organization within my own college called trac trainee association uh, 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 trainee research association of kgmu and it had come again in media in times of india and all i was one of the co-founders and uh, uh, unfortunately it didn't turn out the way i wanted it to be but then i still had this idea of starting a network which is inter college and india network which eventually became a sort of a global network so um the reason why i felt that it's necessary is because uh there were few people who i knew from before um uh, not just in my college but also from other colleges who i worked with who i trusted and who i had uh, uh published with before so i uh, was involved in research with them from before um, uh, even from my first year so i realized that okay we have we have a group of people at least about at the time around 25 30 people who i knew were very experienced and who were reliable enough and at the same time they were too many juniors and people across the country who were approaching us after um, looking at our profiles and our achievements uh, they were asking us for help so that's when i realized okay there is a need for creating this platform where we can actually work in teams and uh, it would facilitate exchange of ideas and collaboration especially in uh, you know research designs like reviews and all it was easier to conduct and uh, uh, i and one of my batchmates before we started this research peer network with this intention and uh, yes it did wonderfully i mean uh, we were able to publish a lot in the process we organized a structure within the network so yeah now we have a really good solid network of over of about 400 people across the country and some of the best student researchers are in our network we are doing a great job uh, i can see that so if any of the medical students are watching this i definitely recommend joining the research peer network so uh, for a medical student you just mentioned that it's nice to begin with the statistics part 
So in a similar way, are there any courses or internships which you do recommend? As far as I know, you have done several uh, internships at different research institutes in the country. Notably, you have done an amazing internship at ISER Pune. So I would like to know more about that internship and as well as any recommendations on courses or internship which medical students can apply. Okay, so coming to research internships, it started off, I think the first internship that I ever did was in my second year, towards the end of my second year. Uh, it started off with this desire for uh, actually experiencing basic science research. Uh, as some of you might be aware, basic science lab-based research is different from the kind of clinical research that we do as uh, medical professionals. So, uh, uh, an interesting story uh, in my second year as uh, it came to an end, I think last few months were left and um, I really wanted to work in a lab as well. So, I had approached my um, uh, my professors uh, in KGMU who were uh, in the department of uh, CFAR, Center for Advanced Research. And there are some really good labs there. So I wanted to actually uh, work there. I mean, not exactly work there, but visit and learn from those labs. And uh, uh, unfortunately, I was denied eventually because I was a medical student, MBBS student. So I didn't stop there and uh, I kept looking out for labs and I found this uh, cytogene research. Uh, it's a private facility, it's a lab uh, located about 50 kilometers from where I used to stay. And um, I was one among the first uh, medical students to have ever approached them and they were like, okay, uh, they, they usually get uh, pure science students like uh, BTECs and, uh, and BSc and MSc people approaching them for thesis. So I actually went there, I was like, I want to train myself in molecular biology, in advanced molecular biology. So I went there for four weeks and I had to accommodate my academic schedule as well. So I had to wake up at five in the morning and I had to travel my scooter for about 25 kilometers and reach there for two hours. I used to study in between. Whenever I used to get lab breaks, I used to study. And uh, I trained myself for, for, in a, for a month. And uh, yeah, I ended up doing well even in my second year professional exams. So I got a distinction in microbiology. I mean, what I want to say is anything can be achieved if you really want to, and if you pursue it uh, consistently enough. So that was my first experience in uh, doing any kind of internship. And uh, my next experience came in my third year, right after my uh, step one exam, USMD step one exam. So I had actually signed up for the medical students uh, research training program, MedSRT program in uh, CCMP in Hyderabad. So it's a very prestigious uh, internship for medical students. They select about 20, 25 students across the country. And uh, it's just for two weeks and they provide you accommodation. So I went there and I met some of the most amazing people. And, uh, uh, you know, meeting people is also important, right? Because whoever I met and I trusted, they, I, I also added them in my network. And uh, I've collaborated with them for a really long time now. So, um, and the experience was also wonderful. Uh, so it was designed in such a way that in the mornings you had these lectures from scientists who used to talk about their works. And in the evening you had uh, lab-based training in molecular biology. So um, it was a really good experience. And in fact, uh, I would say it was also a life-changing one because uh, I met some scientists there who I was so inspired by, uh, like Dr. Ishwari Venkatesh. Uh, so she's a neuroscientist there. So uh, anyways, uh, I actually met her and uh, 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 we interacted and there was a lot of uh, insights that I got. And I also decided to take up a PhD uh, eventually after I complete my uh, medical training so uh, that's a different story but my point is it was a life-changing experience and i would definitely recommend medical students to apply for the medsrt internship and then uh, after that I'm, I'm just talking about all the internships that i attended in chronology okay so the next uh, internship or i would say it was a short workshop of sorts was uh, the DIPS workshop, the Developing Indian Physician Scientist workshop. Uh, this year, I mean, at the time in 2023, it was conducted in March in Jipmer. And uh, uh, it was also a really good experience where uh, they select about 40, 50 students across the country. And that's where I got to meet uh, many people from uh, other colleges, including Ames, Delhi, Jipmer. And I formed a very solid network with them. And some of them are again in my research network today. And um, following that, 
experience i would say the most uh, uh i would say impactful and inspiring experience was actually the one that you mentioned in iser pune so that was actually an unexpected one i had applied for it and uh, so the camp training in iser pune is uh, basically the form stands for competition approaches in memory and plasticity and uh, it's basically meant it's a neuroscience school for about 17 days it's intense and it's meant for phd's and post docs mostly and also exceptional undergraduates as they call it in their website so i was fortunate enough to get selected for that i was one among the only two medical students who were selected for it uh, along with bhavik mansil in aims delhi so we uh, attended and um, i would say the internship blew my mind because uh, uh, we had lectures from mit scientists from people all over the world com- computational neuroscientists very accomplished people and uh, it sort of opened my eyes to the world of neuroscience and how much less we know as clinicians compared to neuroscientists and um, yeah i think uh, that one experience also solidified my decision of doing a phd in neuroscience along with uh, after my uh, or before my post graduate training so yeah that was a really interesting experience i also got to interact with people across the country i mean across the globe like there were few people from i remember there was a guy from japan there was a guy from greece uh, so it was a really good mix of people and again uh, i made some of the most uh, meaningful connections in my life uh, with many friends there who are uh, still connected with me so yeah uh, uh, what i want to tell you all is try to apply for as many internships as many uh, workshops as you can in person once because in the process what happens is it might change your life you might decide to do something else or along with what you you had already planned or it would also uh, lead to making so many new connections building a network and i think that is the essence of research and science okay thanks a lot for your insights uh just uh, now that you have mentioned uh, regarding applying for all these different internships Uh, one question which i really am curious to you know is uh, what about the attendance and stuff while when you're going for these internships at different places across the country so this kgmu have no issue with the attendance uh, personally i have attended the iisc internship you might be aware of that so i attended that it was difficult to get uh, the permission from the college and when i went there we had 35 medical students and i found that it's a common problem in india as well like most medical students as i've said they are not research heavy and they probably have a difficult time allowing medical students during cut uh, during their lectures and postings they have to give it up and go for a 2 to 4 weeks of internship so how is kgmu in that regard was it supportive was there any other way that you could uh, get your attendance okay uh, that's a good question and i think it's important as well so like i mentioned see these internships and uh, these experiences right it um uh, it is one of the essence of research like i mentioned so um, in kgm i can talk about my university uh it is it depends on the dean and i won't get into the details of it but um, i would actually recommend students to plan out their timeline that's what i did so mm-hmm. according to the official um, nmc guidelines right i think uh, you need 80% attendance mm-hmm. and uh, 20% you can take leave and that's how i had planned my um, my timeline in such a way that uh, it wouldn't compromise my attendance and kgmu has is, is a little bit laxed uh, mm-hmm. when it comes to uh, these things eventually uh if you are a person who studies well enough and if your attendance is not too bad then uh you have ways to make up for your attendance okay but i wouldn't say uh i wouldn't recommend people to skip classes uh plan out your uh, schedule in such a way that you are not missing out on your important classes neither are you uh, short on attendance and um uh, across uh, india i mean i know this is a, a genuine problem and you have to sit down with your dean and hopefully they are very reasonable and you have to convince them that you know this is a really interesting opportunity and in fact what can also help is if you can show them the notices that are uh, circulated that are released by that institution uh, which mention that they are for medical students for mbbs students 
like medes rt specifically mentions that it's for mbbs students i'm sure iac also mentions that it's for mbbs students right so um it's important to show that circular it's important to show that it's also a reputed educational research institute uh, in the country and uh, you, you should also uh, know how you would make up for attendance even mentioning that to your professors or to your dean is important as to how you you would handle your attendance if it is short right um in many of many times what happens even in my university they often issue a no objection certificate but they mention that you know provided that the student is not short on attendance it's it's his responsibility right so uh, i i wouldn't lie i was also denied uh, the opportunity to opportunity to attend some of these internships uh, uh, from my university but i'm also glad that they did allow me to attend the others which i did eventually so it really depends on the dean and it depends on how you pitch your uh, uh, requirement and also it depends on how you plan out the timeline i always planned it out in such a way that i wouldn't have a shortage in attendance or neither would i miss out on important classes okay now coming to a different point uh, that is regarding the type of research so often medical students that is another issue that they have they are confused between clinical research and basic science research or lab research so what is your advice which is better uh, if you are planning for usmle for your post graduation if you're going at that clinician route which do you think is better is it better to have a mix of both is it better to have more on the clinical side what is your take on this okay uh, so there is nothing called as better right i mean it's a very huge debate even among doctors whether research is really a requirement or not right so i won't go again into that but uh, my personal opinion is i think research is necessary even if you don't conduct research as a doctor or as a physician you should at least know how to interpret research and for that reason you should at least know what research is and how it works because nowadays we're moving into an era of evidence based medicine and if your practice is not not based on the latest research and the guidelines that are derived out of it out of them uh, it's your your practice is uh, of low quality right you're not a good doctor basically so uh, that's also an issue among doctors in our country and elsewhere they don't follow the latest guidelines they don't understand research i mean i mean that culture it has a lot to blame with our system but i think eventually it is improving in many places so uh, regarding your question which is better i wouldn't say basic science is uh, basic science research is better or clinical research is better each have their own importance i personally uh, like both and that's the reason why i um, decided to also do a phd um although the thing is uh, i mean my point of view is in the spectrum right if you have basic science research at, at one end and clinical research at the other end doing both puts me at a position where i can actually translate findings from a lab into actual research so mm-hmm. that's the motivation behind my decision mm-hmm. but uh, i like i said both have their own um, importance and once you enter mbbs right you're already you have already taken a step towards the physician route so physician physician scientists the new term that people uh, i mean it's trending now and that's that was the central theme of the tips workshop that i attended in jipper so physician scientists are basically doctors who also conduct research not necessarily basic science research even if it's medical research clinical research and it's a trend now and i think that's brilliant and those who are actually involved in research as physicians or physician physician scientists i i believe they are uh, invariably better doctors in many ways if not in treating patients at least in terms of research and knowledge so which is also an important component in medical practice so um yeah i i would say both have their own uh, place and it's not too late you can still take up basic science research many doctors have done that um and in the us you have this md phd concept in india you don't so if you really want to pursue research you probably have to do a phd or some kind of masters if you want to do basic science research after the bps uh if not i mean uh, pe- there are people who have done that as well as post graduate training so that's again uh, a different breed of people uh, and i aspire to be one of them so uh, answering your question i think both are important in their own ways having uh, mentioned about the md phd program uh, i have an announcement in that regard that uh, this year when i was doing my internship at iasc they gave us an announcement that iasc is actually planning to build and in fact they are 
building uh, India's first MD PhD program. So IIC is on its way to build a medical college. Hopefully, when that opens, we'll have India's first MD PhD and DM PhD program. So it's a great step, I believe, uh, in that way forward for creating India's own physician scientists. Now, uh, I need to speak about the research that I said uh, in the introduction part about the meta-analysis, something which I was, uh, not just me, anyone who came across that would be greatly and massively impressed. Would you like to speak more about that, elaborate uh, about it for the viewers? Sure. Uh, so you want me to talk about meta-analysis or the meta-analysis that I conducted on cerebral palsy? I mean, uh, about the cerebral palsy, the one I spoke okay. on the intro. Like uh, so how amazing I, it is and what it implies for the future of cerebral palsy. Sure. So um, there's a very interesting story behind it and I had written about it uh, on LinkedIn as well. Um, it, it started off in my uh, uh, pediatric postings in uh, my third year. Uh, so what happened is I I came across this um, four-year-old child uh, with cerebral palsy and uh, it didn't strike me initially but then when I saw the child and when I actually performed the examination and uh, when I interacted with the parents that's when it started uh, sort of hitting me emotionally and mentally and I could see the, uh, the distress that the parents had and uh, the emotional toil on them so uh, uh, there was one particular sentence that uh, her mother, uh, his mother, actually said. Uh, she said it in Hindi. She said, uh, uh, basically, what she said was, "If I had known about this condition that he was going to develop this before, it would have been much better." Because uh, of many reasons, right? Because I think the doctors had already told her that if he had got diagnosed before. Uh, even after he was born, maybe within a year or after one or two years, it would have been a better outcome because physiotherapy and the speech therapy and all these therapies, right? Uh, they work on this basis that the earlier you intervene and the more consistently you intervene, the better outcomes you have uh, simply because the nervous system has a greater degree of uh, plasticity early on. And uh, yeah, uh, it, it's just a basic developmental neuroscience concept. So. Uh, that sort of hit me and I thought, okay, um, when I start, I, that's when I started learning a lot about cerebral palsy. I started researching on it. I started reading up on it. Uh, wherever I got information, I started off with the uh, OB guy textbook that we all read. We get, like, I read up the cerebral palsy chapter in that. I read up the references there that were mentioned. I read up many articles on PubMed and then I just came across um, a couple of case control studies. Uh, they were conducted in Europe. And uh, they were uh, on uh, some of these markers which they had studied, uh, beta HCG and PAPPA. And uh, I just thought, okay, why why don't we actually meta-analyze these markers and see if they could actually be deranged during the antenatal period, like during pregnancy itself. And if we can diagnose, uh, I mean, diagnose would be a technically wrong word, but I think I'll use it for now. Uh, if we can, let's say, identify the risk of developing CB or cerebral palsy, before birth itself, it would be revolutionary. And the thought came to me in third year itself, once I saw these uh, case control studies. And at the time, my research peer network was already up and running. So I recruited a couple of people from my network and, uh, excuse me, and I also included a couple of my batchmates. And uh, we started screening the literature and we we had this really good search query and we, we did all the steps that are involved in the meta-analysis. And then once I analyzed the data, I, I, at the time, I was not very comfortable with analysis. So I had a colleague who, who did that for me. So uh, we, we did not get any significant results. And I was I was devastated. Uh, this I was devastated for about like two, three weeks. Uh, I was mentally affected because uh, it was one of my first meta-analysis. I wouldn't say the first, but it was one of my first meta-analysis. And, um, and I was way too excited about what it could have led to. So that's the reason why I was appointed. So, but I kept looking at the data. I just kept looking at the data sets. It did not make sense. Like intuitively, each of the studies had reported either a decrease or an increase or whatever, but our meta-analysis didn't. So um, I then realized that, okay, we actually made an error in extraction and it, was a, uh, we, it wasn't benign at all. What happened was we had extracted the uh, 
higher than 95% threshold values instead of lower than 5%. So we incorrectly concluded that there is no increase in the markers while there was actually a significant decrease. Mm. So that's when I corrected the data and analyzed it and then realized that, okay, there is a decrease, significant decrease in PAPP levels. So I was blown away. I, I, I mean, I, I couldn't get sleep even after that. So uh, then um, I, I was invested in the data and, I, and then I did a sensitivity analysis. And then I realized after removing one particular study, even beta HCG was significant in the first and second trimester. Even that was significantly decreasing. So uh, then I had to uh, uh, identify what is causing this, uh, this influence, undue influence of one study that it had like 0.00 something percentage of the total sample size. How was that influencing the overall outcome to become insignificant? So um, I read up the papers. This It happened over a course of a few months. Uh, I, I literally read up every single reference also of that paper. And one find I just realized, uh, I don't know how that clicked me, but I realized that that study, which I removed uh, uh, while doing the sensitivity analysis, they had, uh, I think, multi, multi, null was the majority of that uh, study. They had around 60% of null gravitometer. And I thought, okay, the rest of the studies had about 60, 65% uh, of their fee, of their study population as multi gravida women. So when I uh, saw this, uh, nulli gravida as in like primary gravida because now they're pregnant, um, I I made a hypothesis saying that okay, if if they are primary gravida, that means it might lead to increased beta HCG levels, and that's the reason why I'm getting an insignificant result. It was just a hypothesis I made. And then when I searched a few papers, I think a couple of basic science papers, uh, another paper published about 10, 15 years ago, they had proved the same thing. Uh, I mean, they reported the same thing. So I was excited. Okay, I made a hypothesis and it was proved right there. And other than that, I also got this idea of doing a meta regression and uh, I extracted the variables and luckily we had enough sample size to conduct a meta regression and we found a significant beta coefficient that also again proved the fact uh, that uh, there was an inverse correlation uh, uh, if a woman is primary gravida compared to multi gravida she would have increased levels of beta hcg and that got proved there so um, mm -hmm. we had two markers all of a sudden when, at the stage we had no markers uh, so that's when you know things were uh, I, I would say like i said i was blown away with emotions and i approached my professors my mentors and they were really excited because they're also in the field of neurology and i have I, I even approached a pediatric neurologist uh, from my university and she was so happy and uh, they read my paper and they gave a few suggestions i added them as authors and uh, there was another issue that i faced uh, uh, so we wanted to identify how much that marker actually decreases in uh, pregnancy so doing that is not easy unless we have the raw values of uh, every single patient or at least the mean raw values but each of these studies they had subjected those values to a lot of transformation right so first they, they reported the multiple of median and uh, even they made a geometric version of it by taking log versions and it's difficult to statistically handle these kinds of data and then you know back transform them and then identify what is the exact decrease in the level of markers. Me and my professors, my statistician colleague, we had lots of discussions about these. I read up Higgins original papers, I tried different kinds of formulas to try to back transform it. It didn't lead us anywhere. So we decided we'll just do the analysis using MOM or multiple of median and that is accepted in literature. And uh, even in that we came across one issue wherein one study had this uh, confidence interval of 1.01 uh, to 1.01 mm -hmm. and that basically means uh, that particular study has infinite evidence according to our uh, so it basically excluded the study automatically and I wanted to include it so that was actually a study conducted by Dr. Mads Langarsen uh, uh, Mads Larson I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing his name um, uh, Dr. Mads Larson so I he's from Denmark and I had to I emailed him actually asking him for data and I wasn't expecting any response but he emailed me back within 24 hours uh, with decimal places up to six places. So I was excited. Even my statistician colleague was excited. We did the analysis. So that's the story of that paper. And uh, I won't, I'm not going to lie. It We were so excited that we submitted that in very uh, reputed journals like Lancet and JAMA. And, uh, it did not get accepted there. Again, uh, it was heartbreaking. But then 
uh, most of the those editors had to say that it's better suited for a more specialized journal mm. so again with no hope i we did submit it to uh, jama neurology i mean uh, to pediatric neurology and uh, it got accepted and we added one of the most influential and one of the most impactful uh, pediatric neurologist uh, child neurologist of our country dr uh, shefali kulati uh, who is the hod of child neurology in aims delhi and she happened to write the cerebral chapter uh, palsy chapter that i read uh, in the textbook so she agreed to come on uh, board and she is one of the senior authors in our paper and it got accepted and uh, that's the story of that paper and i'm sure um, the findings of that paper is uh, revolutionary because uh, like if i can try and make you guys understand uh, cerebral palsy is uh, a nervous system disorder which is sort of non progressive in nature it mostly affects the motor domain so um, you can only diagnose this condition about about 1 and 1/2 to 2 years after the child is born and early diagnosis is mostly based on uh, like looking at the body movements like there's generalized motor movements assessment and uh, definitive diagnosis is based on uh, clinical features as well as well as neuroimaging mri so that is when that is where the current field stands right now in terms of diagnosing cerebral palsy but my study pushed back this timeline to before birth in the first and second trimester itself so that is why it's revolutionary and uh, yeah i i would say i'm just uh, fortunate enough to have discovered this and at the same time there's no lying it needed a lot of consistency and grit to pers- to be persistent and uh, to cling on to it and to make sure that okay it leads to something it's such a remarkable story for such a remarkable discovery um, truly i'm amazed and impressed so before we end this what would be one final piece of advice for someone starting out to research and if you don't mind this is an optional question you can choose not to answer this question what are your future plans the way ahead uh, the pathway of a physician scientist what do you have in mind so sure, i don't mind answering that um so your first question is about uh, any other advice so uh, see research is something i would say it's it's really, i i would say you should pursue it for many reasons and some of them are philosophical in nature mm-hmm. um my personal motivation behind research is that uh, it has this long term impact on not just one or two individuals or not even hundreds but it has the potential impact on millions of people not just now but for generations to come uh when i talk to my friends or other people my juniors about research and they ask me uh, why should i do research uh this is what i tell people um so you're a clinician uh let's say you become a good doctor you become a successful doctor and you treat many people throughout your life and you save many lives perhaps uh it's great but um this is how my mind thinks right um uh, it's just a personal opinion but i feel that the impact that you can have as a physician is restricted to patients in your timeline there you're going to i patients are going to die eventually 200 300 years from now um research on the other hand has the potential to imprint your name and your contributions to mankind forever um uh, in uh, all these publications are going to stay uh there are in the form of electronic electronic records and uh, we we remember scientists who have uh, contributed so much in the field of science uh because their impact is there even today um mm-hmm. uh, any kind of discovery any kind of drug discovery it will have an impact for generations to come on millions of people and people will remember you for that and i think that's uh, one of the greatest things you can do as a human to contribute to mankind there's no doubt being a physician it is a noble profession and there's no arguing there uh you are helping as many people as you can and that should be done but research will help you enhance your contribution and make it permanent it will sort of put a stamp or pers- a permanent seal in in the form of your contribution towards mankind so that's my personal uh, motivation behind research and uh, of, of another advice i would want to give uh, any medical student is try to be consistent it's very easy to get motivated with research just like any other thing in life but in my experience i've seen many people who have started off with research and they sort of give up some somewhere down the line it's very important to be consistent and to be consistently curious as well and uh, you should be persistent and uh, you should follow um, what is supposed to be followed in the course of research because research takes 
time it takes a lot of patience even my own study which i just spoke about um, i discovered biomarkers how i mean it, it took me about um i would say easily one one and a half years for the entire study to get completed and more than that for it to get published and i know many people who give up just after a few days mm. research it's the nature is not like that you need a lot of patience and you need a lot of dedication and commitment so that's my piece of advice to anyone who wants to take up research and um you don't really have to take up research and give up your profession of being a doctor that's not at all the case it doesn't have to be the case rather um there are perfect examples of this of people who have done md phds or who have completed their md phd dms or uh, any other degree and they've gone on to do phds and who are also practicing as well as doing research uh, side by side uh, so it doesn't mean that you're leaving your practice right it just means that you have to put in a lot more effort um regarding my personal plans um so like i said i decided to do a phd in neuroscience most likely it will not be in india um uh, it will be in the us or maybe in the uk um so i want to do my phd in neuroscience before my post graduate training and i want to pursue neurology after that uh the the my my focus actually even in uh, i phd for now what i have thought which might not be the case uh me hopefully it is the case is i uh, pursue neural regeneration uh, so my interest is actually in uh, neuro neuro neural neural recovery and uh, neural regeneration after traumatic uh, brain injury and spinal cord injuries because i actually want to make a paralyzed man walk again a blind person see again uh, a demented person to think clearly again and that is my motivation and uh, that is only possible if i pursue uh, neural regeneration and recovery and uh, there are few scientists who do that in india i like i would like to train under them initially so uh, dr ishwarya venkatesh is one such a uh, scientist in ccmb so uh, yeah that's my plan for now and probably do a fellowship after neurology residency uh, in neurocritical care stroke or maybe there are there is a specific uh, fellowship even in neural recovery and regeneration right it's in a few places like harvard and ucla so if i'm fortunate enough i'll probably do all of them but you never know where life takes you but that's my idea as of now okay so we are coming to the end of this session i must say that um i have spoken to many people across different fields so i'm a curious person i like to know about a lot of things i have various hobbies and interests but there are very few people that i have spoken to who actually made me think a lot uh, about uh, different things and you have opened a new perspective i could sense as you have mentioned a philosophical side of research and that is really important to mention because a lot of us especially the medical students as you are aware of we enter into the research for i believe that not the right reasons so most of us we get into research for the usmle purposes or for getting into post graduation uh, like training so in that regard we often see many of these researchers as numbers so it's like a numbers game rather than an impact game like uh, who has the most number of publications so all of these usmle every year they release the number of average number of publications and abstracts one needs to match all these kind of data it makes us medical students go in that direction where we are behind the numbers rather than the impact but by speaking with you for the past one hour you have just opened a new world for all the viewers who are watching this video that research is about impact not about the numbers and i could sense the philosophical side with the way you mentioned everything the story of the mother who inspired you to take this journey uh, and uh, about that meta analysis so i am beyond impressed we are all just happy to have had this time it's uh, definitely one of the most impactful interviews i would say the most impactful interview that i have done so far on this channel so thanks a lot vinay thanks a lot for your time thanks a lot for agreeing to this and i really hope that you do a lot of positive impact much more than what you have done now all the best for your future i'm glad thanks a lot same for you thank you